we're going to begin by talking about social norms. Sociology is defined as the study of human social behavior, <clears throat> but there are lots of animals that depend on groups and social behavior for survival. Ants are social animals, wolves are social animals, bees are social animals. There are many different social animals. So why is there a science of human social behavior? What is it about human social behavior that's distinct from animal social behavior? <clears throat> well, uh, when animals form groups, there has to be some sort of mechanism, some sort of means of maintaining order among them. If the survival of the group depends on certain behaviors from members of the group, then there has to be a way to make sure every group member does his or her part. <clears throat> In the beehive, the drones have to feed the queen, the workers have to collect uh, the nectar, the queen has to lay the eggs, there's a division of labor. You know, what would happen to the beehive if the workers decided they were going on strike, if they decided that they weren't going to work? Uh, so the social system of these animals depends on everyone doing their job. Well, how is that ensured? In the animal kingdom, this kind of social order is ensured by instinct. Uh, and these instincts are encoded in the genes. And for the purposes of this class, let's define instincts as something that is species-wide. That is, it is shared by uh, every member of the species. <clears throat> All members of the uh, animal society have this instinct. And we'll say that these instincts are ineluctable. There's nothing you can do about instinctual behavior. The, the, the genetic instinct mandates the way that you will behave. And that is how uh, social animals maintain order among them. The social behaviors that they engage in uh, are literally written uh, on their DNA. For example, um, Look at these migratory birds. These are geese flying south for the winter. And one of the interesting things about geese flying south for the winter is uh, when they get ready to migrate and they start to travel, they arrange themselves into the form of a V. Of a v. Uh, and that's an interesting, efficient social arrangement because it works on the same principle as NASCAR. The birds that are behind, <clears throat> the bird that's uh, in front there, uh, are drafting off that bird, and uh, when the bird in front gets tired, it will move back and another bird will take. So you have a very um, efficient design system that allows geese to migrate south much more efficiently than if they just went uh, in a big blob. Well, now, how do they figure that out? How do they know how to do that? How to do that? Well, this behavior, uh, through natural selection, has been encoded on the genes. Now, you can raise a goose from the egg through uh, a, a little gosling all the way to adulthood. And if it's released into the wild and it uh, gets ready to migrate south for the winter, it will know to arrange, it, to arrange itself uh, into the form of a V. It's not something that has to be uh, directly learned. If you think about your your dogs, your domestic dogs, these dogs are not that far uh, removed from their wolf ancestor. And they have many wolf-like behaviors still in them. Have you ever seen uh, a puppy chase a little uh, toy across, a little squeaky toy across the room and bite into it and make it squeak, squeak, squeak while it shakes its head? Well, that is the puppy practicing tearing out the throat of its prey. Um, and that shaking of the head is, you know, ripping the juggler out uh, of the neck. That's a uh, behavior that is instinctual to the dog. And it is a legacy of um, its <clears throat> wolf ancestry. If you put a bunch of how together, if you have a group of dogs together, eventually they'll pack up and they'll choose an alpha dog. Uh, and they'll maintain order among themselves. Uh, in in ways that are very similar to wolf packs because a dog's behavior, for the most part, is governed by these instincts. Now, 
the the interesting thing about this is that humans are social animals as well, but we don't have instincts in the classic sense. That is to say, there's nothing written in our DNA, or there's nothing in our biology that can't be overruled by force of will. That's not to say we, we don't have biological predispositions and biological urges, but these predispositions and urges aren't stronger than <clears throat> our willpower, uh, our ability to overrule them. So people might say, oh, isn't there a survival instinct? Yeah, I suppose there is, but people over their survival instinct all the time. Suicide is a common form of death. Isn't there some sort of maternal instinct? Yes, uh, when babies are born, a uh, chemical called um, uh, oxytocin is uh, released into the mother's brain uh, that forms some sort of a biological bond between the mother and the child. But that bond is not unbreakable, and we know that because mothers sometimes kill their children. Um, even basic urges, like hunger, can be overruled. There are plenty of political prisoners in history who have starved themselves to death on hunger strikes. So even your desire to eat can be overruled through force of will. Uh, things like your sex drive can be overruled through force of will. There are many priests, for instance, who have uh, assumed a life of celibacy and never have sex for the period uh, of their natural life. So we don't have instincts in the classic sense. <clears throat> so if we don't have instincts in the classic sense, and instincts provide order for social animals, how do we provide order? Uh, the answer is that humans have what sociologists call norms. And norms are the fundamental building blocks of social life. Just like atoms are the fundamental building blocks of matter, norms are the sort of fundamental building blocks of of society. And they're little rules, they're little prescriptions or little proscriptions that tell us what to do and what not to do. Our own little quasi-genetic code for providing order. Norms are the fundamental rules for how things in social life are accomplished. Rule that governs your life. Uh, and there are so many of them that they're virtually uncountable. So, for instance, if I uh, <clears throat> laid out a buffet table and put all kinds of different foods on this table, and I said to this class, pick out the foods that you can, um, uh, using good manners, eat with your fingers, and those that you would eat with silverware. And you would immediately be able to pick them out, and there would be a high degree of agreement, agreement among you. If I said to you, you know, here's an article of clothing... Or here's a table full of article of clothing. Uh, put clothing. Uh, put put these put these garments into two piles. Uh, a pile of garments that are designed uh, for women to wear, and a pile of garments that are designed for men to wear. Um, and you could you could do that. I mean, obviously there are plenty of unisex garments out there, but you could look at certain garments and be there would be agreement among the class that the designer of this garment intended it to be worn. Uh, by either men or women. These norms are almost as powerful uh, to us as instincts are to the animals. There are no human societies that don't have norms. So, what are the properties of norms and why do they have so much power over us? Well, here are some characteristics. Number one, uh, they are widely shared. So uh, I gave the example of gendered clothing uh, and that we uh, can all pr pretty much decide whether a particular garment is made for men or whether it is made for women. Number two, uh, I would say that norms have uh, what I call uh, oughtness. They have some sort of moral component to them in the larger society. Uh, what tends to happen is um, people look around and this, they look at the way things are and they assume from the way things are that that's the way things ought to be. Now, this philosophers call this the conservative bias or they sometimes call it the naturalistic fallacy, the, ten, the tendency to look at the state of the world as it is 
and assume from the state of the world as it is that that's the way the world ought to be. So in the larger society, we have clothes that are designed for men and clothes that are designed for women. And you ought to wear the clothes that are appropriate for your gender. And number three, if you don't conform to the normative order, there are sanctions or punishments that are associated with behavior that departs from the norms. You can um, get into some trouble. So <clears throat> in the larger society, uh, there still are punishments. If I uh, was to dress up in, in drag and walk through the Avenues Mall, I don't think it would bother my colleagues. It wouldn't really cause much of a stir at UNF. But if I was to walk in the larger society, say down the Orange Park Mall, I'd get some funny looks. I'd get some stares. People might say something to me. Um, and all of those funny looks and stares, those are little social punishments that are designed to let me know that what I'm doing is not appropriate and is, and is uh, uh, something that we don't approve of as a larger society. Okay? Uh, but not to worry. Because, number four, norms are taken for granted. And by taken for granted, what we mean, uh, you know, with in, in the larger culture, taking something for granted means um, to not think about it or to not attend to it. And that's a bad thing. But in sociology, something that's taken for granted is so ingrained that you don't have to think about it. Like when I go to J.C. JCPenney, uh, I go straight to the rack for men's clothes. And I don't even think about how certain women's garments might look on me. <clears throat> it's just completely ingrained. Now, roles about gender, roles about gendered clothing, all of these things um, may be breaking down in society, but they, uh, the, 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 that's gendered clothing is just one example of this kind of thing. Right? Think about the picture here shows people waiting in line. If you saw a queue at a checkout stand, or if you see a queue anywhere, uh, and you need the service of whatever's happening at the front of the queue, you would get in line. We all understand how lines work. And, uh, you know, there's just something wrong about cutting in line or jumping the queue. And try it sometime. Go to the grocery store where there's a nice long line uh, of people with their shopping carts waiting and see what happens when you try and muscle your way up the line without waiting. You will experience sanctions. You will be punished by the people that are in line one way or the other. But most of us just don't think about it. Have you ever uh, been to a place and you look at the line and you say to yourself, ah, that line's not worth waiting in. I'm going to do whatever it was you were going to line up to do. Most people will do that. They'll just leave before they'll sit around and think about how they're going to jump the queue. Because the fact that we're all going to wait in line is uh, pretty much taken for granted. So what this means granted. So what this means is that norms are a sort of social shorthand that allow us to fulfill obligations without having to think about them. Uh, uh, and um, Waiting in line is an example. Gendered clothing is an example. Or think about driving. When most of you drive, well, when all of you drive around town, you drive on the right-hand side of the road. We all drive on the right-hand side of the road. Uh, you ought to drive on the right-hand side of the road. And if you don't drive on the right-hand side of the road, there are all kinds of punishments, ranging from, you know, having somebody honk their horn or flip you, flip you the bird to having the police give you a ticket, to dying in a traffic accident. Uh, so these are the properties of a norm. Now, the interesting thing about norms is that they are socially constructed. They don't exist in objective, empirical reality. You can't show me where it's written in the cosmos that you should drive on the right-hand side of the road. And we know that driving on the right-hand side of the road is completely a social convention because in other countries, um, like in England, they drive on the left-hand side of the road. 
<clears throat> and that way of driving is widely shared and you ought to do it. And there are sanctions if you don't. And it's pretty much taken for granted. Uh, and so uh, the, 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 if you think about what it would be like to drive on the other side of the road, you can see that you know these norms, um, even though they are socially created, they still have a lot of power over us. And, and look at these pictures here. And this will give you another idea about norms that are completely socially constructed. The color pink is not inherently feminine. The color pink is just a color. It's a, it's a point on the spectrum. And uh, we have just decided, we have just concluded that pink is a feminine color. So uh, I remember one day uh, my son was laying on the sofa and he said, Dad, I'm cold. And I picked up his sister's pink blanket and threw it over the top of him. And he immediately kicked off. And I said, you know, why'd you kick off the blanket if you're cold? And of course he said, pink is a girl's color. Pink is a blanket for girls. <clears throat> now, he didn't learn that in my house. That's not something I would say. Uh, or that's not a rule that I would enforce. And it's not something that would come from my wife either. Either. That seeped into the ether, the I, from the ether. The, the idea that pink is a feminine color is something that uh, is just out there, that he soaked in through the TV or from his peers or things like that. The idea that a skirt is feminine and that pants are more masculine is also socially constructed. The kilt there is perfectly masculine. Like The, the, the idea that lace and frillies and all that stuff, the, the notion that that's inherently feminine uh, is wrong. It's just that it's a social convention, but these social conventions uh, can take on a, a life of their own. So imagine a symbol like this one. What does it mean? Uh, in the United States, it means A-OK. -okay. Uh, and you can put that up a sign to say, OK. Uh, but suppose you are uh, in a rest restaurant in Europe and the waiter comes up to you while you're having your meal and of course your mouth is full and he asks you how the food is and you make this symbol with your hand and suddenly the waiter looks taken aback and offended because this means okay in the United States but it's an obscene gesture in many countries in Europe refers to a part of the body that is not discussed uh, in polite company. Some of you may know that this symbol has been appropriated by white supremacist movements. Uh, the, uh, these movements started uh, a, a guerrilla a pamphleteering campaign where on college campuses they would post pictures with the phrase, it's okay to be white. And this uh, symbol was appropriated because the fingers are making the sign of OK, the, the thumb and the index finger are making the sign of an O, and then the three other fingers, the middle finger, the ring finger, and the pinky, are making a W. It's OK to be white. Uh, and that is a sort of alt-right white supremacist symbol. And you can see how if that sort of meaning took, o took over, um, then this symbol would change from one that is an innocuous way of saying okay to one that uh, that suggests that you have uh, sympathy with um, racist movements. So these symbols change, they morph, but there's no inherent meaning in that symbol. It's just a configuration of the fingers on your hand. We are the ones who give it meaning because it doesn't have meaning of itself. So that is why sociologists say that norms are subjective. They're just made up. They're not really real. But as this diagram shows, once there is consensus, once everybody agrees that the rule is legitimate, then this subjective made-up thing might as well be real. I mean, what people believe to be real is real in its consequences. 
something that we make up can take on the character of objective reality. Even though it's just made up, it doesn't matter. It takes on a life of its own. It might as well be a part of the physical environment. There's no differentiating between uh, things that are part of the physical environment and things that are part of the social environment when it comes to norms. Uh, all kinds of things that we um, think of as part of the actual um, the, the actual nature of the universe uh, are actually just made up. For example, putting numbers on time is just a matter of social convention. There's no such thing as 2 p.m. There's no, uh, it's not written in stone anywhere, and we know that because when it's 2 p.m. here, um, it's noon in Denver and, and uh, uh, 11 a.m., in San Francisco, and it's later in the afternoon or in the evening um, in Europe. So uh, we just sort of look at the clock and say, okay, we all agree that that's what time it is. And as long as there's consensus, we can mess around with that. Daylight savings time, for instance. In the spring, we move the clock back. We all agree. Um, or we move the clock forward in the spring. That's right. And in the fall, we move the clock back. Uh, and so, uh, as long as everybody agrees, there's no problem. Now, you can't say to yourself, oh, I'm tired, and time is a social construction, so I'm going to set my alarm, you know, I'm going to set my clock back an hour to catch an extra hour of sleep. The consensus is the thing that matters. Some of us just celebrated uh, New Year. There is no point on the Earth's orbit around the sun where you could say that a new revolution, a new, a new orbit starts. January 1 is a completely arbitrary spot to pick for the new year. That's not any sort of cosmological beginning of anything. You know this because the Chinese have a different new year and Jews have a different new year. And these are just different arbitrary socially constructed days where different cultures say this is where the year begins. But, you know, you can't so much as uh, centered on the idea that January 1 starts a new year, so much as centered on the idea that it is what time it is, that these features, which are made up and socially constructed, might as well be written in the cosmos. So uh, the the point here that we're making is that you know, we live in a world that is uh, uh, completely made up, but there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, and there are lots of different examples of this. So take the case of fashion and the idea that some clothing is fashionable and other clothing is not fashionable. That some clothing is prestigious and other clothing is not prestigious. Uh, setting aside the quality of the materials, the aesthetic appeal of the design of any particular garment or any particular designer is completely subjective. People like it because they like it. Uh, but once there is consensus about what people like, then that thing becomes fashionable or that thing becomes trendy. And once it becomes trendy, it takes on a life of its own. So, for example, when I was in high school, the cool thing to wear were Ralph Lauren shirts that had these polo logo, logos uh, over the left breast. And they still make those. Um, and back when I was a kid, they were expensive. There was no TJ Maxx or Ross, and so you couldn't get them secondhand. And so they were uh, at higher-end department stores only. And... Uh, when I was younger, my parents didn't have a lot of money, and we were not uh, particularly well off compared to the other kids that went to my high school. And so their parents were more able to afford those things than my parents. And so uh, other kids wore those shirts, which were fashionable, and I wore shirts that were not fashionable. I wore shirts that were similar, uh, but without the logo. And uh, I would always say to my peers in high school, well, look, you know, that shirt's 100% cotton. This shirt's 100% cotton. They're virtually identical. If you put your hand over the horse logo, 
uh, there would be no way to differentiate between your shirt and my shirt. I mean, they may have been made in the same factory and just the stitching was put on. I mean, literally the only difference between the two shirts is that one has the logo and the other doesn't, or I guess one costs four times as much and the other doesn't. If you took a swatch from my shirt and a swatch from your shirt to the lab, uh, they would both come back 100% cotton. And uh, these arguments were not persuasive, as you can well imagine, because what makes them cool is not any inherent property of the garment. It is the fact that everybody agrees, yeah, that logo is cool, and we will pay a premium for shirts that have that logo. When you think about it, that's kind of a silly thing. The shirt on the right here um, is uh, from a line at J.C. Penney called Hunt Club. And they sort of caught on that the horse was cool. And they couldn't, of course, mimic the Ralph Lauren horse because that would be a trademark infringement. So they made their own horse. And my mom bought me some of these shirts. And I was like, oh, God, Mom, that's even worse. Uh, the, the wrong horse is worse than no horse at all. I mean, the fact that you're wearing a shirt with the wrong horse just reinforces the idea that the right horse is double extra cool. So these are first world problems. These are uh, the kinds of things that kids encounter in high school, but it was a very stressful thing uh, for kids to not have money in a stratified high school like mine. Um, it was hard on me because if you don't have cool clothes, you don't get to hang out with cool kids. Uh, and everybody in high school wants to be cool. And it was hard on my parents. And I know it was hard on my parents because later in life, uh, when they became more affluent, uh, when they had money, uh, they would always send my son, every Christmas and every birthday, would, they would send my son Ralph Lauren clothing with the little polo guy on it. So they sort of understand um, that it, it, uh, that even though these ideas about what constitutes fashion are silly, you can't reason your way out of them. They didn't come to the fore because of reason, and uh, they're not amenable to argument. You can't just say, well, this is socially constructed. So fashion is a good example of something that is a human creation that then acts back on us. Sociologists distinguish between two types of norms, mores and folkways. Mores are important rules that are essential for the functioning of society. Uh, if the mores weren't in place, if the mores weren't upheld, then the society itself would collapse. Think about architecture, a particular beam that's essential to the, uh, the structure, or some sort of a bearing wall that... that, that that without it, the building would collapse. Well, that's what a more is like. It upholds society. So, for instance, all societies prohibit stealing. Because if you didn't prohibit stealing, if people could just take things willy-nilly, then social order would be impossible. All societies say when you can or when you cannot use violence. You can't just use violence uh, at your whim. There are very specific rules for who can and when. All societies uh, say who can have sex with who and when, because a sexual free-for-all would be anarchy. So that's what mores are like. More important norms that are essential for the functioning of society. Folkways are a different class of norm. They are norms that make social life more pleasant or that make things more convenient and easy for, for everybody else. So, for example, the, exam, uh, the example I gave of waiting in line, that's better than a big mob, uh, you know, that just uh, uh, presses forward to get whoever is, to get whoever is at, the, at the front of the mob. There are some countries where they don't wait in line. There are some countries where the mob is how they do it. Uh, the queue seems to be a little bit more uh, sensible in my opinion. Uh, there are rules about uh, bodily functions. Everybody farts and everybody burps, but there's a time and a place for it. And if you do it in a particular setting, you will uh, uh, 
be sanctioned for it. People will look at you funny. People will give you a dirty look. Um, but uh, society won't grind to a halt if you fart inappropriately or belch inappropriately. There are rules against it, but those rules are not that serious. And because there is a distinction between mores and folk folkways, there are different types of punishments for mores and folkways. Generally, uh, mores are punished using uh, formal sanctions. That is, some legitimized power or entity, like a government, administers the punishment for violating a more. So if I steal, then the police will come get me. And these are formal sanctions. Uh, you get things like jail and fines for violating uh, a more. So these are things that are punished by legitimate powers in a formal way. Folkways have what we call informal sanctions. Um, being ostracized is a, a common punishment, a dirty look. In the car, if you cut somebody off, they'll honk at you or they'll flip you the bird. So these informal sanctions are, uh, cause a person psychological pain. They're not going to take you to jail or they're not going to um, fine you, but they'll uh, use a sort of psychological pressure on you. It's very unpleasant to be uh, informally sanctioned, even though it won't cost you money um, or your freedom. So that is the general difference between folkways and mores. So this is different from the way that the criminologists look at things. Sociologists distinguish between formally sanctioned mores and informally sanctioned folkways. Criminologists distinguish between what they call crimes mala en se. Mala en se uh, is Latin for sort of bad in and of itself or self-evidently bad. Uh, and mala prohibitum. So crimes that are mala en se are wrong because they are manifestly, self-evidently wrong. I don't have to make a case to you for why homicide is bad. I don't have to persuade you that stealing is wrong. But there are other crimes that are just illegal for uh, a, a variety of reasons, and they're just wrong because they're prohibited. So um, we'll talk uh, a lot in a, in a minute here about marijuana, uh, and the laws against marijuana are uh, there for a variety of historical reasons, um, but most people would make the case that they're not there because Marijuana is uh, inherently worse than alcohol, for example. So uh, the more, for those of you with a criminal justice background, the more folkway distinction is sort of the sociological analog to criminology's distinction between things that are uh, mala in se and mala prohibitum. And this points out a fundamental difference between criminology and sociology. Criminology is concerned with things that are criminal and sociology is concerned with things that are deviant. Uh, crimes are against the legal code, the actions that, are, that violate legal codes and threaten the legitimacy of the state. I mean, that's the essence of a crime. A crime uh, threatens the, the legitimacy of the state. Uh, whereas uh, deviance uh, is, prompts moral outrage. Deviant acts are morally outrageous. And so as you can see here, we draw a little Venn diagram. There is a little bit of a difference between things that are deviant and things that are criminal. Um, and you can see there's lots of overlap, but the correspondence is not one-to-one. So if you think about something like stealing, stealing, thieves are morally outrageous people, and stealing is a morally outrageous act. It also threatens the state, and so stealing is a criminal act. So being a thief is both a deviant thing and a criminal thing. Uh, using, uh, assaulting somebody um, is both morally outrageous. If you uh, um, think of all of the um, high-profile cases of domestic assault 
and think about the public shame that's been heaped upon those people, in addition to the fact that they're in legal jeopardy. So the society uh, is outraged morally, and the state has been uh, threatened by an illegal act. And so these things are both criminal, and they're both deviant. However, some things that are deviant aren't criminal, and some things that are criminal aren't deviant. So, for instance, uh, if I join a weird cult and start dressing in orange robes, and me and my neighbors have, uh, you know, rituals and dances out on our front lawn dressed in our flowing orange cult robes, the neighbors are going to have a problem with that, and they're not going to like it, and they're probably not going to invite us over to the neighborhood barbecues anymore, but they can't call the police because it's deviant to join a cult, but it's not illegal to join a cult. I put up uh, bronies there, the deviant subculture. These are adult men. Uh, you can Google this. Be careful when you Google it. These are adult men who are fans of the children's television show, My Little Pony. And they are into this show, um, and they have brony conventions, and they have brony porn, and they write fan fiction. It's a bunch of adult men that are totally obsessed with the show for little girls. And most people think that's weird. But you, you don't go to jail for that. It's not against the law to be involved in some sort of a weird subculture. Um, if I, for instance, decide after I finish this lecture that I want to buy a bottle of scotch and drink it till I pass out, I can do that. And if I want to do that every single day, uh, there's no crime against it. It is deviant to be an alcoholic. People will talk about me behind my back. I will lose friends. But if I want to destroy my body with alcohol, that's entirely my business. Um, by the same token, some things that are crimes don't provoke moral outrage. Technically, speeding is a crime. Um, if I invite you over to my house to watch a movie, and you say, hey, I've been wanting to see that movie, where did you get it? And I say, oh, I just downloaded it. You probably won't be morally outraged about the fact that I stole a movie. But that's what happened. Downloading a movie is essentially stealing it. And it's a weird kind of theft that we sort of uh, uh, overlook in this society, that we see as... You know, it's the kind of theft that's not morally outrageous, but it definitely is uh, illegal. And you can be sued for music piracy if the studio finds out that you have uh, that you have stolen their movie by downloading it. You can see there are some things that sort of straddle the line. Tattoos, for instance. Um, when I was college age, having a tattoo was... A more deviant act. Having a tattoo was something that um, uh, people thought said something about your personality or your personal tastes or your behavior or the kind of person that you were. And these days, not so much. These days, tattoos are found across all kinds of different uh, uh, styles of life and political orientations and worldviews and things like that. The tattoo once was deviant. It's really not anymore, for the most part. Uh, although we'll talk about how uh, the uh, about how um, extremes in things that aren't deviants can still become deviant. Uh, I put homosexuality up there because in a previous generation, in your grandparents' generation, people thought about gay people then the way that we think about pedophiles today. Uh, people believed that gay people were um, immoral and perverts and, uh, and th there was no tolerance for it at all. And now, um, for most people, homosexuality is just a sexual preference. Um, some people fall in love with, uh, are attracted to people of the same sex. And that's just not a big deal. Well, it was a big deal when I was college age, and it was a much bigger deal. Uh, it was uh, unspeakable when my parents 
were college age. And so these things tend to evolve and change with the times. Look at marijuana. What should we do with marijuana? Is it deviant to smoke marijuana? Uh, how many of you know for a fact that your parents smoked marijuana? I'm not even remotely concerned if I admit to you in this video lecture that when I was in college, I smoked marijuana. Uh, because that was a very common thing. Barack Obama uh, admitted that he smoked marijuana. Uh, how deviant can it be if the president has done it? I would imagine you know most of your parents would have to admit to it. I would imagine most people in Congress would admit to it. Now, in most states and in Florida, marijuana is still illegal. But is it really morally outrageous? Are you outraged that I admitted something like that? Are you going to run and tell the dean um, that I did something like that uh, when I was in college? Well, I don't think it would matter because I don't think there would be any punishment associated with it because if every professor uh, at UNF who had tried marijuana when they were in their 20s was uh, punished for it uh, decades later, then there wouldn't be any of us, uh, any of us left. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes things are either deviant or not deviant based on the extent or the degree to which one engages in them. A uh, tasteful tattoo judiciously placed on the arm is not considered deviant, but covering your entire body uh, with tattoos probably is. Similarly, Marijuana may be deviant or may be criminal in Florida, but it's sold in stores openly. It's completely 100% legal in Colorado. Uh, I was in Las Vegas um, uh, this past October, and there was uh, advertisements. There were advertisements all over for stores selling marijuana. There was a convenience store on the Strip that was selling joints. You walk right up to the counter and buy marijuana. Uh, and it was weird to me, um, because for my whole life, marijuana had been uh, something that's criminal. And now marijuana is legal all along the West Coast, in Nevada, in Colorado, and in several New England states. Um, Michigan was the latest state to legalize marijuana through a, a ballot uh, initiative. And so I think the trend is for marijuana to become more and more uh, socially acceptable, less deviant, and not criminal. It's hard to know whether the uh, uh, lessening of the criminal penalties for marijuana has led to it being less deviant, or the fact that marijuana is less deviant has led to the lessening of criminal penalties. I suppose they probably have uh, something of a chicken and egg relationship. So how do norms come about? Well, there are essentially two schools of thought. School of thought number one says that uh, there exists within society a general agreement, a level of consensus about what should be allowed and what should not be allowed, and that the norms emerge from this sort of consensus. This is what we call the functionalist approach. And that is the idea that norms are there to codify and legitimate things that uh, people want codified and legitimated, that the norms are imposed uh, on society essentially through the will of the people and that they serve the people. That's the functionalist view. Uh, and that's a very common view in sociology and one uh, that dominated sociology in the 1950s. The other view is what we call the conflict view. And the conflict view argues that society is comprised of different competing interest groups. And each of these interest groups have their own ideas about what should or shouldn't be moral. And that they are engaged in the business of uh, trying to persuade you to see things their way. That the norms that exist in our society are essentially the work of what the sociologist Howard Becker called moral entrepreneurs. 
Now, a business entrepreneur is someone who wants to sell you a product. A moral entrepreneur is someone who wants to sell you uh, a morality. And so the idea is that to the extent that there is consensus in society, it's because moral entrepreneurs have convinced you to come over to their side. And the conflict there sees society as constantly in flux and sort of constantly at war with itself as different power brokers vie to um, define society. 